Hi, uh, my name is Benjamin Lee, and I just want to welcome everyone. It is now 1 p.m., so we'll begin our presentation shortly. Today on October 18th, we'll have our presentation on legal issues involving with the drilling for natural gas and the siting of electric generating facilities in the state of New York, given by Wendy Marsh. For help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the questions box and we'll be able to answer during the presentation. Here is a list of sponsoring chapters, divisions, and universities. I would like to thank all of the participating chapters, divisions, and the universities for making these webcasts possible. These are the upcoming webcasts. To register for these upcoming webcasts, please visit utahapa.org webcast and register for your webcast of choice. We're now offering distance education webcasts to help you get your ethics or law credits before the end of the year. These webcasts are available to view at utahapia.org webcast archive. To log your distance education CM credits, go to planning.org slash CM. Select activities by provider, select APA Ohio chapter, then select distance education and select your webcast of choice. Follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook and we also upload our videos on YouTube so please follow Planning Webcast. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast please go to planning.org slash CM select today's date October 18th and then select today's webcast. This webcast is available for 1.5 CM credit. We are recording today's webcast and it will be available along with a six slide per page PDF of the presentation at utahapa.org webcast archive. At this time, I would like to introduce Art Buckley, who will introduce our speaker, Wendy Marsh. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Wendy A. Marsh, a partner at Hancock Estabrook, a counselors at law in Syracuse, New York. Wendy is a partner in the environmental practice and a leader in traits on representing small and large businesses, uh, manufacturers, contractors, lenders, borrowers, hospital, educational institutions in the areas of environmental, zoning, and land use law. Ms. Marsh counsels clients on environmental compliance, including assisting on permit, audits, and defending clients in enforcement actions commenced by regulatory agencies, including U.S. EPA, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, New York State Department of Conservation, and other local environmental authorities. She also has extensive experience in assisting clients through environmental issues that arise during transaction refinancing activities, which often trigger the uh, un known uh, environmental liabilities of properties. Ms. Marsh routinely assists clients through remediation programs at both the state and federal level, including the uh, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA, or Superfund program, in Inactive Hazardous Waste program, the State Superfund program, New York State Spills program, Brownfield Cleanup program, and Voluntary Cleanup programs, as well as compliance with the related asbestos requirements of the New York State Code uh, 56. She is also involved in litigating cases in state and federal court on issues of liability and cost recovery for such remedial activities. Ms. Marsh also assists clients in, com in compliance with the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Act, uh, OSHA. She also represents clients on land use matters such as zoning, planning, and historic preservation laws. She assists municipal boards, counties, and developers on compliance matters relating to applicable zoning laws as well as compliance with the State Environmental Quality of Your Act and federal and state historic preservation laws. Ms. Marsh 
represents both boards and developers in navigating through the local development approval process, including compliance with CICRA. Costly litigation. She brings years of experience to this uniquely local area of law, which comes into play when clients are dealing with controversial projects, such as large-scale wind energy projects. Further, in order to withstand potential legal challenges, Ms. Marsh provides assistance with ensuring secret compliance relating to all individual components of the local approval process. She is a published author and frequent speaker on environmental issues in the law. Ms. Marsh? Thank you, Art. And I trust everyone can see my slides on their screen. And as you can tell from the title, this will be uh, primarily a focus on New York State, but because I know that there's participants that practice in other states and work in other states, I'll try to make it more general than staying in the weeds in New York State. Before I give a presentation on hydrofracking, there's usually someone that comes up to me before I get started and say, now is this going to be a presentation that's pro or against? Um, and in my response to that question is this presentation is intended to say where we are in the process from the legal side, from the regulatory side, and some thoughts on where the decisions might be made. It, it's not intended to be pro and it's not intended to be anti. So I, I thought I would answer that question that, that usually arises um, at the beginning. The, we're going to go through the state regulation of high volume hydro fracturing in New York State. Um, also talk about the municipal regulation of the drilling activities. There's some very fascinating ca cases working their way through the courts. Um, also the landowner's involvement in the drilling process. And then to the extent we have time, um, I would like to draw some parallels between the regulation of other electric generating facilities under the new Article 10 of the New York State Public Service Law and in particular for large-scale wind turbines. And then again, some thoughts on the future. So starting first with Marcella Shale. Um, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with this background, but I, I think it's always a, a good idea to understand why we're talking about these controversial legal issues. Um, this is a formation that actually extends northeast from Ohio and West Virginia through Pennsylvania and then into central and uh, southern New York. As you can see on the map, this is a, a New York specific map. Now geologists believe that there's as much as 489 trillion cubic feet of natural gas or over 400 years supply for New York State at its current level of use. Um, the depth in the formation of the shale has made extraction difficult and expensive. And there's recent techniques that we'll spend some time talking about that makes recovery of the natural gas in this shale economically viable, which, which is why we're talking about this issue today. Hydrofracking, um, that's a somewhat of a slang term, and what is it? It is essentially where you have a vertical well bore, which there's been vertical well drilling in New York State for over 100 years, and after it's drilled to the depth, just above the target gas bearing formation, the well bore is then extended horizontally. And that's the main difference in this technique is that there's the ability to drill horizontally. And that is drilled in the gas bearing rock, which in this case is the Marcella Shale, for up to several hundred feet. And also there can be multiple wells that can be drilled laterally from the same vertical well. The, you get the hydro portion of the word is the fact that there's a significant amount of fluid that to create fractures in the rock which allows the gas to flow. So that's the new technique associated with the fluids. The hydrofracking fluid consists mainly of water and uh, there's two components in the water. There's a component of sand or a propping material and the other component in the water if you're opposed to hydrofracking um, you will liken those to um, dangerous chemicals, and if you're in favor of hydrofracking, those are similar to solutions, um, similar to um, dish soap. So 
there's a, there's a, a wide range of words that are used in the chemicals that are that are inserted with the hydrofracking fluid. But essentially, the purpose of them is to carry the sand in order to allow those fractures to remain open for the gas to flow, and also to prevent the growth of bacteria as part of that process. Now, for each well, there can be a million or more gallons of water needed to frack each well. Um, so there's a significant amount of water. And the water needs to be transported to these sites, and it can be as many as 200 truckloads required to supply the water necessary for a single well. So on to the regulation component. In New York State, the environmental impacts of a project are reviewed under the State Environmental Quality Review Act. Now, each state is going to have a program with a similar name. Um, the federal program is NEPA, and some states will have a state NEPA or a different name of that sort, but every state has this type of review, and I, I'm sure all of you are familiar with whatever your state process is. In New York State, any project that is approved by any agency, there needs to be a determination on the environmental impacts before that decision is made. And in New York State, what's issued by that board is either a negative declaration, which means that there's no environmental impacts that need to be studied, or a positive declaration that says that there needs to be additional study of the environmental impacts. The primary document is an environmental impact statement if there are impacts to be in investigated and studied. And of course, in the hydrofracking, they have gone through the process that there's environmental issues to be investigated. So the main component is an environmental impact statement. There's components for public comment, and there's a requirement to respond to those public comments. And then the ending of the seeker process is seeker findings. And this presentation will go back to seeker on a number of different levels because it really is an area of law that, that is specifically set up for this type of situation where um, the public and the regulating agency can do some investigation work and make some decisions on what the impacts are. Now, specific to drilling activities in New York, there was a generic environmental impact statement on oil, gas, and solution mining for the regulatory program that was prepared in 1992. And what that document did is took a look at the drilling activities in 1992 and talked about the environmental impacts associated with those and completed a seeker review at that time. The word generic means that it's generic to the entire state. It isn't site specific. So it doesn't talk about specific environmental impacts that may be on you know, one specific road in a community or in one specific um, geological formation. It's, it's more on a generic nature. And when this new hydrofracking technique came into being um, in you know, late 2000s, you know, I, DEC originally, we already have this in generic environmental impact statement. We already have a process to issue mining permits. You know, is this so different that we need to start from the beginning? And regardless of what DEC thought of originally, certainly we all know at this point that, yes, there's a number of environmental impacts that required further study. Um, this slide just highlights the, the main environmental impacts um, we could do a whole presentation on those issues. Um, the first one is the chemicals in the process water. And, and as I alluded to, there's different versions of how many chemicals, the impact of those chemicals, um, how they act in the solution, uh, depending on the, the framework where you come from. But that's one of the main environmental impacts. You have the noise activities associated with the drilling of the well. Now, those are temporary impacts associated with Um, and I have an et cetera there, but the, the other main one is how do you deal with all that water? How do you get the water into the well? How do you deal with the spoils that come out of the well when it's drilled? And how are those handled? So with those environmental impacts in mind, a DEC came out with a supplemental 
draft generic environmental impact statement in September 2009. And they took a look at the new environmental impacts associated with this hydrofracking, with the additional water, with the chemicals, and this entire new process. And they came up with a draft. And that was in 2009. And on that draft, there were comments, because as I showed you on the first slide, that one of the seeker processes is to receive comments. And there were public hearings. And the first one, they had about 2,500 people attend the hearings and about 200 verbal comments made during those hearings. And they also received about 13,000 written comments on this first draft supplemental generic environmental impact statement. Then the politicians became involved and there became a significant public involvement on this discourse. And DEC was directed to revise their draft supplemental generic environmental impact statement. And, and that was a directive from the governor to go back and take a look at it again and do another draft of the environmental impact statement. And that was actually issued in September of 2011. And unlike the first one, there were a lot more public hearings. and. That when the public comment period ended in January of 2012, there were tens of thousands of comments on this next round. So in a little over a two-year period, those comments grew from 13,000 to tens of thousands. So clearly this, this is an issue that the public is, is very, very involved in. And where we are in the formal process for the seeker process, DEC needs to respond to each of those tens of thousands of comments. And they have been working on it since the comment period ended in January, but they haven't gotten to the point where they prepare what's called the final supplemental draft generic environmental impact statement. And in essence, what that document is, is a response to all those comments. We were told that this year, but I don't believe that's going to actually happen um, due to a couple of other things that we're going to talk about today. So right now, status quo as far as DEC reviewing those comments and preparing responses. Now the seeker process is not necessarily the law that's going to either approve or deny the issuance of permits for hydrofracking. It's a procedure that's set up to learn about the environmental impacts, figure out ways to mitigate them. But ultimately, what really the, the legal teeth is a permit, is a mining permit to allow this activity and what are the permit conditions going to be and what is what, what are going to be the legal requirements. And those will come out in terms of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation regulations. And as I mentioned, the DEC has been issuing mining permits for decades now. Um, so they have a system in place for applications, for reviewing those applications, for public comment, and for issuing those applications. But because of this new technique, what they need to do is revise those regulations and have them specific to the hydrofracking activities. And that's what they did. And they actually proposed the regulations, which are amendments to existing regulations. And the comment period for those regulations to my next slide. They were proposed in September. And it was a pretty quick comment period, to be honest with you. They had the comments ending at the same time that the seeker um, comments ended, which was January 11th. They did hold public hearings on the regulations. And under New York State, when you're proposing regulations, there's a certain time frame that you have to comply with. And the last public hearing on these proposed regulations, and again, these, this is the real meat of the program. This is what you know the, the people in New York State are going to have to live by, is what these regulations say. The last public hearing was in November of 2011. So there's a requirement for the state to complete those regulations within a year, to finalize them. And for the folks in New York State or who follow 
um, some of the discussions with the commissioner and the governor on this issue in New York State. There was recently a directive to study the health impacts. And that was a directive from Gover Governor Cuomo. And it was sent over um, to Commissioner Martens to study the health impacts associated with drilling. And it just happened within the last few weeks. And the question is, who's going to study those health impacts, whether it's going to be the Department of Health or an independent study or they have not seen details on that. And I also haven't seen whether or not the study of those health impacts are going to somehow be put back into the seeker process and or require amendments to those draft regulations. My crystal ball on this is that the study of these health impacts is going to require some amendment to the seeker process and some amendment to those regulations such that the process is going to have to start over. Um, I don't have a framework for what that means as far as starting over, but I would expect there will be another round of public comment um, specific to the health impacts, and that certainly is going to, to change the timing process in terms of when DEC is actually going to make some decisions on seeker and some decisions on the actual regulations. Um, it's possible that this may have been a decision to push back those controversial decisions by DEC until after the election um, so that you know the, the actual issuance of any final action by DEC would happen in uh, 2013. Now my next topic is on, well, by, by way of summary, um, we have DEC needs to complete the seeker process, issue the final regulations. There will be litigation over seeker and there will be litigation over the regulations. So even under a best timing scenario that the health impacts that are currently directed to be reviewed are formalized into the draft and something final is issued by DEC in terms of the seeker findings and the regulations in say first quarter 2013, there's going to be years of litigation before I think those will be finalized. So the next topic here is local authority. We talked about the state authority to issue permits and we also talked about how the legislature has become involved a bit. And we all know that this is a very controversial issue that arises as we get our coffee, as we eat our dinner, as we tell people that you know we work in a field even related to environmental. There, there's a lot of opinions out there and there's a lot of discussion on it. So there's also a significant amount of activity at the municipal level, which for purposes of this call, I'm, I'm sure you're living with it. Um, it becomes an election issue. It becomes an issue that, that's, that's subject to voting and um, political power. And it's interesting that this is an issue that was actually discussed during the presidential elections, and yet it's actually our, our town boards and our uh, village boards that are actually making some pretty significant decisions with regard to this important issue. So in New York State, some things can't be regulated locally. Um, adult entertainment. If any of you are in a municipality where there's been someone that wanted to come in and um, put in an adult entertainment business, um, I'm sure your lawyers had to tell you that you can't ban it. Your, your town board may want to, your supervisor may want to, but it can't be banned because of First Amendment rights. Then there's also components of sand and gravel mining that can't be regulated, and we're going to spend a, a fair amount of time talking about that. And then wind turbines. Um, we will hit on the ability to regulate the, at a local level. And why can't you regulate things locally? And some authority is preempted, and that means that the state has said you can't regulate it. It's going to be a, a state-level regulation, and that can also happen on the federal level. That can be done through the state constitution, the federal constitution. Um, it can be specific laws, statutory laws, and that's one that we'll be talking about. 
And then usually the courts have to examine whether or not something has been preempted. And the, the cases are, are pretty interesting as we go through them. So the seminal case in terms of hydrofracking is a case called Matter of Fru Run Gravel Products versus the Town of Carroll. And this was a case that was decided in 1987. And this was a case that looked at the Mind Land Reclamation Law. And the Mind Land Reclamation Law governs sand and gravel mining. And what that law says is that the statute says that for purposes stated herein, this title shall supersede all other state and local laws relating to the extractive mining industry, provided, however, that nothing in the title shall be constructed to prevent any local government from enacting zoning law or ordinances or local laws which impose stricter mined land reclamation standards or requirements than those found herein. So this law is in essence saying that it's superseding any local ability to control it. For sand and gravel mining, and they don't want a local municipality to tell a mine land reclamation company how to do their business. Well, in the matter of Fru Run, that municipality wanted to ban sand and gravel mining completely. So what the court had to do to see whether or not the municipality had the ability to prohibit it completely within its boundaries. And this was a case that went to the highest court in New York State and looked, the judges looked at the, the provision and said that it, it ultimately decided that it didn't take away municipalities' authority to ban mining activities. What, it, what the judge said is that the ordinance regulated property uses. So by prohibiting it, you're actually regulating the use of the land as opposed to the mining activities themselves. And the statute said that was specific to compliance bond and it different requirements for fees and reclamation and hours and types of drilling operation. And the judge, in essence, said that the municipality couldn't regulate those type of activities, the actual operation of the mine itself, but it could enact land use regulation that's applicable to all of the property uses. So one of the arguments um, that was made in this situation was that the purpose of the Mine Land Reclamation Act was to allow the most mining in the state. And the judge didn't really see it that way. Um, what the court said is a municipality is not obligated to permit that exploitation of any and all natural resources within the town as a permitted use if limiting that use is a reasonable exercise of its police powers to prevent damage to the rights of others and to promote the interests of the community as a whole. So this is the, the case that every hydrofracking case kind of refers back to. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this holding even though it's sand and gravel mining. But the underpinning of that decision is that as long as your land use is regulating the property and not specific to the operation of sand and gravel mining, then it would be upheld. And there's, there's a number of other cases specific to the sand and gravel mining to say what a municipality can regulate. You, you can't regulate the actual We, we don't need to go into those for purposes of the hydrofracking discussion. So the next statute we're going to talk about is Article 23 of the ECL, which um, also has oil, gas, and solution mining. And that's a, a different title under that article. The sand and gravel mining is under Article 23 as well. So the seminal case on this one is in the town of Dryden. 
and it was recently decided, and this, this is going to become the seminal case on hydrofracking. The town of Dryden, in August of 2011, um, amended their ordinance to ban all activities related to the exploration for and production or storage of natural gas and petroleum. Um, one sidebar on this case is there's actually wells, I understand, in the town of Dryden. They're not the hydrofrac wells, but the standard wells that, that we talked about earlier in this conversation. So there's some that uh, that this law was enacted, and um, the, there's, there's existing wells actually doing that drilling activity. Um, in any event, um, Anschutz had leases for over 22,000 acres which is over a third of the town. Um, so after this law was enacted, they commenced an action against the town of Dryden and asserted that there was that the oil and gas solution mining law preempted the town's ability to prohibit that activity. And the interesting part is which will ultimately come up in, in some type of litigation, is that the petitioner claimed that they had uh, expended approximately $5.1 million in activities before the enactment of the ban. So the legal issue that the judge had to decide was, is the ability to prohibit the activities associated with the exploration for production or storage of natural gas or petroleum preempted by the oil, gas, and solution mining law. And just like I, I read to you the provision for the sand and gravel mining, this was a little bit different. The provisions of this article shall supersede all local laws and ordinances related to the regulation of oil, gas, and solution mining activities, industries, but shall not supersede local government jurisdiction over local roads or the rights of local government under the real property tax law. So it is a little different than the one that was discussed in Fruit Run but it is pretty similar. And that's where the, the two arguments come in. The petitioner argued that it was completely dissimilar, not the same as Fruit Run, and the municipality argued that they're essentially the same. Case, he sided with the Fruit Run. Um, the decision made the findings that the provisions are nearly identical. Um, and there was an analysis doing a, you know, comparison by comparison. And going back, now that there's, there's neither one of those, mean the sand and gravel in this one, contained a clear expression of legislative intent to preempt local law over land use and zoning. And that's really the crux of the argument. You know, did the state legislator, legislature intend to eliminate any land use control? So the ban was upheld for the exact same reason set forth in Fru Run. It was interesting in this case, there was a similar article that um, the petitioners tried to say that, um, that the, the act was intended to encourage the maximum ultimate recovery of oil and gas regardless of other considerations, and, and the judge just did not agree with, with that assessment. The next case that was decided just about a week later um, is the Cooperstown case in the town of Middlefield. Very, very similar issues. Um, the town of Middlefield board amended its zoning law in, again a month later, actually a month earlier in this one, to prohibit heavy industry for all oil, gas, or solution mining and drilling, which, you know, according to the court, essentially banned all oil and gas drilling in the town. Um, this legislation had a lot more definitions, but in, in essence, it did the same thing as the town of Dryden. <clears throat> and in this case, the, plant, the plaintiff had two oil and gas leases in the municipality. Essentially the same question that the judge stated it just a little bit differently to say, um, does the law prohibit local municipalities from to the local roads and the municipalities' rights under the real property law? In essence, it, it's the same question, but arguably set up just a bit more broadly. 
um, as far as the way the, way the judge um, beat it up. And the judge in this decision actually spent um, a fair amount of time, there's a number of pages, going back through the legislative history of the oil and solution gas mining law. And instead of jumping right to the parallels with Peru Run, it actually, this judge went through the legislative history to in essence hold that um, looking at the legislative history, the court finds no support within the legislative history, um, and including the amendments um, that support the petitioner's position. And again, that the town was without the ability to prohibit it. And uh, again, the judge in its findings uh, essentially stated that the state's interest needs to be harmonized with the local municipalities. And, and the judge in this case basically said that the state maintains control of how such procedures, um, while the municipalities get to control where for the exploration. Now the interesting legal issue out there that has not been subject to litigation just yet is whether or not there is a taking. And in essence, a taking would be that, for example, in the Dryden case, the petitioner in that case claimed that, there had, that they had expended $5 million. And is there an argument that by changing the laws after those property rights had been gained, um, somehow should be compensated by the town? Um, I would expect this will be a legal issue that ultimately will work its way through the courts. Um, although, because these local laws are popping up in a number of municipalities, it, the only people who would have this argument were the ones that had a lease signed before that local law was enacted. The, both of these decisions were made by the Supreme Court which is in New York State our lowest court. And they have both been appealed um, to the third department. Both, they're both in the same department. And the third department has not yet heard the arguments on this. Um, and I would expect the third department will hear the arguments in first quarter of 2013, and the decision will come out at some time after that. Um, it's not clear if these cases are going to be formally consolidated for one decision. They're the exact same legal issue. Um, and I would expect that this would be a decision that's appealed to the highest court, to the Court of Appeals, and that would be the highest court that actually issued that Fru run decision in 1987. Um, so from a lawyer's perspective, it is fascinating law to be watching this through the system to see what the judges are going to do with the municipal home rule. There's one other recent case that I'll talk about, which um, for, for those in New York State, this one has been getting you know, some press at this point because it is another hydrofracking case. And this one is a little bit different. Um, what the city of Binghamton did was enact a law prohibiting gas and petroleum exploration activities, underground storage, natural gas, et cetera. And they did that in December of 2011, but there was a sunset provision. And the sunset provision indicated that it would, um, it would no longer be effective after a two-year period. And really, the, the legal holding in this case um, is that the judge felt that it was a moratorium, and it wasn't a local law. And if the city had followed the procedure for a moratorium, then it may have been able to be upheld. Um, ultimately, it was struck down. Um, and the reason being is that the city failed to provide the proof that would be required to justify it based upon the health and safety of the community for the banning of the gas exploration. And again, it, it hinged on the fact that it had a two-year um, sunset provision. And um, it, it fell on procedural grounds. Now, the one interesting thing in the dicta um, that is generally the headline when you see um, anti-hydro um, folks talking about this decision is the fact that the judge did say in his decision that he agreed with the holdings in the previous cases that we just talked about, that um, the oil gas solution mining law wouldn't preempt the local law. 
So that, that is a, a significant case that, uh, again, another court is agreeing with, with that thought process. So now we've talked about the state level. Uh, we've talked about the municipal level. And landowners themselves can also be involved in the regulation um, of this activity because ultimately the drillers need the authority and the rights from the landowners. And there's a number of land contracts and lease agreements out there um, that had been negotiated a number of years ago and, and certainly are continuing to be negotiated. Um, and it's, it's always interesting when it becomes a, a neighbor versus neighbor issue um, on these leases, you know, wh whether or not you even know that your neighbor has such a lease. Um, but there is that, that local control. Now, in New York State, we have what's called compulsory integration. And that is a very specific procedure that's set up that even if you refuse to agree to one of the land contracts or the lease agreements, if that drilling company is able to get all of your neighbors to agree to a certain percentage, they, get, they have the right to take the gas underneath your property. And the procedure is set up for compulsory integration that even though you don't have the right to say no, you still get compensated for that gas. Um, so there, there's, it, it's two different issues that are out there. Um, they certainly they can take the gas under certain circumstances, but you will be compensated. And there's um, different choices in far as, as far as how that compensation comes in. So that it isn't a fair statement to say that they're stealing your gas. Um, but, but it is a fair statement to say that you don't, you, you lose the right to, to say no. So we went through the seeker process and the DEC regulations, and, and that's going to be a number of rounds of litigation. We have the courts talking about the preemption arguments. And on that issue, my crystal ball on that is that the that the Fru run case sides with the municipality pretty strongly. So if the decisions go to the highest court and the court ultimately decides that each municipality has the right to prohibit um, hydrofracking in their municipality, I don't know how that system is going to, to work in New York State because it would be a patchwork. Um, and not only a patchwork, it would be a patchwork that's going to potentially change at each election system. So I personally see that that second bullet on my slide here is probably going to be something that's, that's going to need to have some public discussion once it works its way through the court system in the next you know, year, year or two years. Um, because that may become a, a situation where the state may choose to become involved, and that would be our, our state elected officials. Now, the third component is the economic reality. Um, the whole reason that the natural gas remains in the shale formation is that it was never economically feasible to drill until the new system came in for um, horizontal wells for high volume hydrofracking. And then all of a sudden, the economics made sense to pursue that option. Now, New York State, the regulations that are currently proposed um, are the most stringent in the country as far as the proposed regulations, um, which means there's a significant amount of additional safeguards. And all of those safeguards cost money in terms of the amount of money it takes to drill the well. So there will always be an economic reality on when it makes business sense um, to be drilling in New York State versus continuing to drill in Pennsylvania or um, some of the other states that have more lenient regulations. What I would see with this economic reality is since we're years out as far as the court system and the litigation, I would assume these two are going to catch up with one another in the future such that by the time everything works its way through the court system, uh, natural gas might be high enough such that it would make economic sense to, to comply with those very stringent regulations, assuming they're upheld, um, and assuming, again, the state doesn't decide to completely ban the activity. So I would see all three of these components 
um, converging it at some point in the future. This is a picture um, just out in front of a place of business that I recently took. And as I work on these controversial projects, um, hydrofracking, wind projects, um, development projects, you know, I always think about, do you really think what we're looking at right here would ever be permitted in any of our municipalities? If someone had to go in and um, that we're in as far as the approvals that are needed um, for the, the that we're asking for at this time. Okay, um, moving on to, to wind energy regulation, uh, what can be learned and how this might start to interplay with hydrofracking in the future. The laws of the past, um, which is what we lived in until last year, if someone wanted to construct a large-scale wind farm project, everything was handled at the local level. And the seeker review that we talked about at the beginning, which is a wonderful procedure out there to learn about all the environmental impacts, was handled at the local level. And that would be the lead agency generally on the wind projects were town boards. Um, they're the elected officials. They're generally the, the political folks that were either elected or kicked off the board, you know, pro or against wind farms. But assuming there was, um, you know, pol politics were interested in pursuing it, the seeker process was one in which that the board could learn about the environmental impacts without before making a decision. Because every town board that has a wind farm, that's their first one. Um, that's the first time they're talking about the birds and the bats. A lot of times the high-level wetlands investigations that are required, the traffic issues, the sound issues, the wind turbine syndrome issues. Seeker was set up for a process to educate the municipalities on that so that they can make an informed decision at the end of that. Usually there was either a site plan approval or a special use permit that was issued at the local level. Uh, again, it was you know, the authority of, of the local municipality on those issues. And with setbacks and um, distance away from the roads, that, that was a local decision. And then the last bullet, which I found very important, was the license or the host community agreement at the local level. And in essence, that was somewhat the financial mechanism associated with these wind turbine projects. And that would be the agreement for the payment that would be made to that local municipality that, you know, in essence is bearing the, the visual burden associated with that wind turbine, um, that would be the agreement that would that would document that. And, you know, it, it's, it's your standard host community agreement, just like landfill, et, et cetera. Um, environmental impacts that were investigated that, you know, the, the local municipality has to, to look at and deal with. You've got visual impacts. You have shadow flicker that impacts some residents versus others, noise impacts, wetlands, birds and bats, habitat, architectural impacts, traffic, property value, archaeological. Um, so all of those would have been looked at as part of the process. Complete local control over the process. Um, I was retained on a number of occasions to help the town board through the seeker process before they would make a decision. Well, the state of New York has enacted Article 10 of the Public Service Law, um, and that is for the siting of major electric generating facilities. This completely takes away the local control. And it, apply, it applies to the siting of major electrical generating facilities, and this presentation is intended primarily to focus on um, the wind turbines. And it's 25 megawatts or greater. Um, there was a thought that that 25 megawatts was actually going to be 80 megawatts, which would have exempted out um, some of the other smaller um, wind projects that would still be able to stay at the local level. And the main component in this is that there's um, a siting board. And th that siting board issues the Certificate of Environmental Compatibility and Public Need for the wind project. Now, who are the members of the siting board? Um, we have the chairs of the Department of Public Service, 
the commissioners of DEC, commissioner of DOH, commissioner of economic development, and the chair of NYSERDA. And there's two seats at the table for the members of the municipality where the facility is proposed. Um, so you have two local folks and five state folks. Decisions are made on a majority. So looking at the issue of the supersession, which is what we talked about with uh, the home rule cases for the hydrofracking, the siting board can grant the certificate even if it's in contravention of the local law if it determines that the law is unreasonably burdensome in view of the existing technology or the needs of or cost to the taxpayers. So even if a local municipality has setback requirements or different types of requirements that would regulate the wind turbines like they had in the past, there's no need for that siting board to enforce them. In essence, um, these wind projects are set up as a, a one-stop shopping. Um, no other state or local permits are going to be requ required for the certified facilities. Now, in addition to the supersession that the siting board can ignore those local laws, um, those local laws need to be brought to the siting board. <clears throat> and the notification to the residents in the municipality has to come three days before the filing of the scoping document. So that's not really a lot of time um, in, in order to really participate in the process. And it, at the same time, there's a number of provisions in Article 10 that say that there's going to be the, the public participation. Um, but in, in essence, there was a, a lot more participation and a lot more ability to participate in, in the process at the local level. Um, additionally is money. When the, the old process where the municipalities conducted the seeker review, the cost for the seeker review was borne by the applicant. Um, so in essence, the applicant was paying to allow the town board to become educated through the seeker process. Um, for good or bad, that, that was the way that the law was set up um, for the, the local municipalities to be able to, to make informed decisions. Now, under Article 10, um, there is an intervener account, um, so there is an acknowledgement for funds um, for the public to participate, um, but it's capped at $200,000, and um, it certainly, of course, is not for litigation. And one of the, the components, I'm not sure how this is actually going to, to work in um, reality, is it, it's set up as an intervener account. And I don't know if the municipalities themselves will be able to access that money or if it's going to be more for a citizen group as opposed to the, the governmental body. Um, and another component, it's a very quick time frame as far as applying for the funds. Um, you have 15 days um, to apply for those funds. Um, then there's another fund um, which will not exceed $1,000 um, that comes in at the application. And again, that's, that's a rather quick window um, to apply for those funds. And you know, we, we started this presentation talking about the seeker review and how important that is in controversial topics. Um, whether you're for or against it. Um, generally, folks that are against a project will use the seeker process to you know, gain as much information as possible and, and make sure every I is dotted and every T is crossed, and you know, that, that forces everybody to, to say. At the beginning of this um, presentation, I talked about on the seeker process, you either issue a negative declaration that says that there's no environmental impact that requires law says you don't even have to worry about any environmental impact. And that's what the state has done with these wind projects, that they're considered type two actions. So there isn't even that preparation of the environmental impact statement that we had talked about previously. So it is going to be 
very interesting to see how these wind projects are actually cited in the future. Again, there is an economic reality associated with the wind projects that in order for them to be economically viable, the tax credits have to make sense. And um, you know that hasn't been lining up for the business um, of constructing those as it has in the past. But when the funding does become available for those, they're going to be cited in a very different manner than they have been in the past. Um, the citing board it has the responsible responsibility to make the final decision based upon the record, you know, your, your standard types of decision making. Um, they're not supposed to grant um, the certificate without making findings about the probable environmental impacts, um, the beneficial addition or substitution of capacity. The project is in the public interest. Um, adverse environmental Im impacts will be minimized or avoided and the environmental justice impacts are avoided, offset, or minimized. So on the wind project side, um, municipalities are going to continue to bear the burden of the visual impacts, um, but they're not going to have the financial benefits supported in the host community agreement. And also the decisions about siting you know, are no longer local decisions um, that in the past really had been made by the majority of the voters in the municipality. If if you saw a town board and your elected officials going away that you didn't agree with, you voted them out. So it, it's, it's fascinating to see the wind energy projects going in a manner completely different than the hydrofracking because right now hydrofracking is, is very much protected in, in my mind by the home rule, um, whereas the wind projects are now completely in the state's hands. And it will be really interesting to see if as hydrofracking works its way through the court system if the state of New York ultimately amends this Title 10 and then puts the drilling, um, the hydrofracking drilling under the siting board and whether or not there would be the political will to make that decision on such a controversial project, you know, in the future. So um, on the future side, I think we're a, a number of years off before we The wells are going to be drilled and where they're going to be drilled. And I think it's going to continue to be much more of a political decision than a science decision um, into the future. Art, you um, may have been taking some questions as I went through. Yes, there were several, uh, Wendy. The one is, um what were the concerns with the, the first draft uh, DEGEIS, uh, just uh, that there wasn't enough public input, or what was the reason for, for continuing it further? Sure. Um, you know, the, the first draft um, was prepared by DEC, and um, they didn't delve in sufficient a, a, a sufficient amount into the details. Um, it was a um, and that is about the time that the that there started to be a lot of political interest in this. And I do think that were it not for the groundswell, um, you know, from the the folks on the street, that that would have went through just fine. Thank you. Um, the next question was, did the prohibitions also stop well pads constructed side of the communities, such as Dryden, from horizontal drilling under the communities and removing the oil and gas in that manner? You know, they were silent in that regard. Um, putting on my, you know, thing regulatory cap, I would say that they were only with regard to the where the vertical well started. Um, but neither one of those local laws were specific in that regard. And the, the reason that I would say it's probably just where the well pad um, is started is because that's where the regulated activity within the municipality would start. You know, there would need to be a building permit. There would, it, it would be difficult to enforce it, you know, for something going on underneath the ground. But, but that has been delved into in detail. Would that, is a question, I think, would there be any um, prohibition of uh, completing um, uh, 
spacing unit in that town so that oh, I, I you, do you understand what I mean so that there wouldn't be any absolutely it, it, it's an interesting question and on, on the legal side you're you're asking whether the compulsory integration would somehow trump the local ban right um, and, and I would say that um, the compulsory it would probably not trump the ban um, just because in order for the state to preempt a local regulation it has to be very specific and I, I'm sure they were not thinking of this as they were enacting that compulsory integration thank you but that's a very good question it's about the host community benefits package one of which of course is um, the wind energy companies are are taking um, every opportunity to get tax credits, um, additional dollars, say from IDAs and that sort of thing. Um, I know that the local IDA here has said that they will not approve any uh, monies from the IDA for a pilot program. They will not approve any pilot programs that do not have local community approval. And in that re in that regard, it may inter in fact, community benefit packet back to back to the local community because it would still need require a, a negotiation with the local community between the community and the the um, prod sponsor. And and that may be a way around it. And again, it it, it goes to the money. If mm -hmm. if the the finances are such that a pilot is required to have it make economic sense, then they may very well have to deal with the municipality. But again, the municipality is not going to be coming into it with the enforce with, with the ability to truly enforce its zoning ordinances. Um, but that may be a, a way around this to, to retain some of that local control so that in, in exchange for that pilot agreement, in essence, they're going to be entering into a contract between the municipality and the, the, the wind developer um, for certain agreements, but it's not going to have the force of law. It's going to be a contract. I'm not sure if there's any other questions. Were there any other questions that people had in their, our audience? Um, no, I don't think so. So well, is there not, a penalty then... if we end early? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, Wendy, thank you very much for your your information. It was uh, a great presentation. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, and. Uh, Thank you, Wendy, for the great presentation. Great, thank you. Okay, sorry we didn't generate too many more questions. <laughs> it's okay. Ben, I do have a question for you. Yeah. Um, this was supposed to have uh, law credits attached as well. Yeah. Okay. Will that will that be reflected on our on the calendar? I hope. Oh yeah, I'll make changes to that. Okay. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thanks. Bye bye. Now. Thank you both so much. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. For those of you who are still in attendance, I just want to go through a few reminders. First off, to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to planning.org slash CM. Select today's date, October eighteenth and then select today's webcast. This webcast is available for 1.5 CM credit. Also, we are recording today's session, so you'll be able to find recording of this webcast along with a six slide per page PDF at utahapia.org webcast archive. This concludes today's session, and I want to thank everyone again for attending. <laughs>